Hey everyone, welcome back to Prime News. Yeah, um, we're doing a Prime News today because there's a ton of stories. I mean, here are my notes. This is two full pages, almost top to bottom, with a bunch of notes because we have so many major stories today that uh, I don't really want to waste any of your time. No jokes here. No, no, no silly preamble. Wait a second, isn't that what this is? I don't know, whatever. For our first video this week, here's Prime News. Let's get into the major stories. And the first one starts with Pokemon Sword and Shield. Yes, I literally just fell forward. It's a little strange. All right, so uh, what's going on with Pokemon Sword and Shield? Well, a whole bunch of things have had. We got a flood of news this week from various interviews and hands-on things from places like Game Informer. But maybe the most interesting thing is that tomorrow there is going to be a 24-hour live stream starting at 8 a.m. Central Standard Time. This live stream is being hosted out of Japan on the Pokemon Japanese channel. We'll put a link to it down in the description. And it's literally like one of those in real life live streams where you stick a camera out in the forest and then like watch an eagle's nest or something. Uh, they're doing that, but inside a video game, it's quite strange. So let's just talk about exactly what they're doing. So the camera, fake camera anyways, will be in Gilmwood Forest, which is part of the Galar region from the game. And literally, it's going to be 24 hours of a camera just looking into the forest. So you're bound to see oodles and oodles of Pokemon and all the shares. I think the idea of this stream is to prove that the game itself uh, is just a, a living, breathing world that's constantly changing. And we're just going to see that over the course of 24 hours. So it's not focusing on gems or, or leveling Pokemon, but it's just focusing on how the Pokemon themselves seem to interact with the world. At least that's the presumption because they're not really telling us anything else other than to tune into the stream uh, whenever you have time and just enjoy this Gilmwood Forest camera. Now, uh, to add to a little bit of the mystique around a living, breathing world in Pokemon Sword and Shield, uh, there is going to be 18 gyms in the game. And that's a crazy number of gyms. There's typically only eight, so 18 is a lot. And there's going to be some different gyms between the two versions of the game. But that's not what makes it a living, breathing world. There's actually two leagues in Pokemon Sword and Shield for the gyms to exist in. Those leagues being the major and minor leagues. And each year in the Galar region, because there is like a, a, a time thing going on, you know, a calendar year in the game, each year in the Galar region, the gyms will change which tier they are in, whether it's the minor or the major. So depending on when you're playing the game could actually affect how what, what, what gyms are in which league and how you want to progress through the game. And as I said, some of the gyms are different between the two versions of the game. So it's not just that the Pokemon are changing up. There's also going to be some differences between the leagues and the living, breathing world uh, and obviously the gyms themselves. So uh, that's pretty crazy. Now there's some additional info we got as well, mostly from Game Informer, such as HMs are not being focused on in this game. They're kind of being dropped out. Uh, and that there's like a thousand people working on Pokemon Sword and Shield, which is a record number for a Pokemon game. However, of note, just because a thousand people are working on the game doesn't mean that they have a thousand developers working on the game. The Pokemon Core development team still has about 180 to 200 people at Game Freak actually actively working on it, which is a good sized team, by the way. It's just, you know, not it, not as impressive as saying, oh, a thousand people are working on the game. But it is notable that they do outsource and hire an outside company to help with Pokemon animations and Pokemon designs. And we're not actually sure how big that team is. Maybe it's 50, maybe it's 100 people. We don't actually know because those numbers aren't ever posted publicly. Uh, and they do hire a company like that for each and every Pokemon game they make. So, well, 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 who really knows what's happening? It doesn't mean they don't have some designs that don't come from internally. Of course they do. Uh, but they, uh, they have an outside company that really helps with a lot of that. So maybe the development team is more like 100 to 300 people. Who really knows? Uh, but what I wanted to point out in that thousand is that a majority of them are basically marketing and localization teams because they are counting marketing and localization in that number. And localization from the you know, the dozens of languages they put in there is obviously pretty huge. Marketing for all the different countries they're in is obviously a pretty huge team. Uh, so just wanted to note that just because a thousand people, it looks like it's this huge number, but it's not quite as big when you just think about who's actually making the game. But hey, marketing and, uh, and localization teams do need to give some credit because a lot of people overlook them in the process of releasing video games, and they shouldn't because those are very important teams. Like without localization, we can't play the game in English. So 
yeah, kind of a big deal. Now there's also an autosave feature added to the game. However, it's completely optional. So if you don't like autosave features in video games and you don't want it in Pokemon, you could just not have it and you know whatever it's, it's optional you can just turn it off uh beyond that masuda has come out and said hey all the pokemon that are cut from this game which basically means you know there's no national decks it's been a big drama all year uh they said will appear in future games however he's not promising that a national decks will ever exist again uh, i think pokemon's probably done you know the pokemon company and game freak are probably done doing a national decks in any specific mainline game anyways there's possible there could be like a pokedex specific game or like maybe a national dex that exists in the pokemon bank or something like that where um you know you can still try to collect them all from all the different games but it's just not going to exist in a mainline game i have no idea because that's in the future and the future is not like certain at least for us uh so there you go that's all the big pokemon sword and shield news and uh i can't wait i'm actually going to tune into some of the stream tomorrow heck uh, if i get an opportunity maybe i'll even live stream uh and have a q a or whatever and talk with you guys and while we're live streaming it i'll put up a, a video of uh of their live stream so we can actually like hey if we see cool pokemon we can comment and figure out who the pokemon are or try to figure out who they are because uh, if they're unannounced pokemon then i mean we don't really know we're just going to guess and say do we like the design so uh it, it might be something kind of cool to have on in the background as uh, we're talking and stuff so uh, we'll see uh, I, I think that's actually a pretty neat concept in fact i'm gonna do that I'll get back to you guys later on what time that stream will be our next story is about PlayStation 4, but it does affect Nintendo Switch because uh, what's happening here is that according to Wired.com, PlayStation 4 has officially left the beta stage of crossplay. Now, uh, Sony's infamously uh, not supported crossplay, then supported crossplay, but then said only for certain titles, it's going to be in beta, yada yada. They've actually rejected a lot of developers and a lot of games saying, sorry, you can't do crossplay. Well, that's no longer the case. It is officially left beta. However, Sony will not be making any public announcements about it. So while it's no longer in beta, what this means is that any game that wants to have crossplay can just have it. Sony's no longer putting restrictions up according to Wired.com. In fact, the first game that's supposed to feature this out of uh, the beta period is Call of Duty Modern Warfare. But it does appear that any game that wants crossplay with Switch, PC, Xbox, all at the same time can have it. So uh, that's good news. And I had a feeling that Sony might do something like this heading into PlayStation 5's launch because it was kind of a big bugaboo against them uh, that felt a little anti-consumer even towards their own customers that might want to play with their friends that might not own a PlayStation. And I know they've infamously said like a year ago, oh, no, we're not doing it because these games are best experienced on PlayStation. But I think we all know that uh, options are good for consumers. So uh, for them to support something that Switch and Xbox and PC have supported for a long time is good news for everyone. So kudos to you, Sony, on sticking to your, you know, when you said you were going to allow crossplay, actually doing it once it got out of beta. Why you didn't let it happen in beta, I have no idea. Why was there even needed to be a beta? Because all of crossplay is essentially handled on the developer side anyways. So it was really strange. Uh, but hey, that's good news, especially heading into next gen. Did you think we were done talking about Link's Awakening sales on the channel? <laughs> I don't think so, because Nintendo of UK, or Nintendo UK on Twitter, I guess as they're known, has announced that Link's Awakening is the fastest selling Nintendo Switch game of 2019 in the UK. Now, it did debut at number one. However, we don't actually know real sales figures in, in the UK because they don't publish them anywhere. So it's kind of left to us to guess unless Nintendo says what the numbers are. So what we do know is in its second week, it was dethroned from number one by the launch of FIFA 20, which we know FIFA is a really big franchise in Europe, especially in the UK. So uh, yeah, we don't actually have any idea how well Link's Awakening sold overall in Europe. However, if it happens to be a really impressive number, Nintendo's probably going to throw it out there during a, during a financial meeting or something. So uh, it, it's something to pay attention to in the future. But right now, uh, with Mario Maker out there, Astral Chain, uh, yeah, I mean, you've got Luigi's Mansion coming up here in Pokemon. Right now, Link's Awakening is the gold standard for games launching on Switch, being the fastest selling game in 2019. So uh, pretty cool. And kudos to... The, those people out there playing Link's Awakening. Hopefully I'm one of you guys here uh, before the year is out. So Mario Kart Tour continues to shatter records. Uh, in its first week on the market, 90 million installs. Just, just let that sink in. 90 million. That crushes Pokemon Go, which has held all prior records. Now, to be fair, Pokemon Go had 
a staggered launch between um, you know Apple devices and Android devices. So it didn't have a big universal launch like Mario Kart Tour had. So who, we don't really know how well Pokemon would have done. Pokemon Go, anyways, would have done if it launched on both at the same time. But what we do know is Mario Kart Tour is at 90 million installs. Now that sounds impressive. But then you have to look at the revenue generated because there's been a lot of controversy around uh, how it, how 200 CCs locked behind a paywall and microtransactions and loot box you know ways of getting characters and stuff like that. Well, it turns out uh, that it actually isn't generating that much revenue compared to its install base. Uh, 90 million installs, only about 12.7 million dollars in actual revenue. A majority of that being made in the United States. Uh, of course, the United States also has the largest percentage of the install base, so I guess that makes sense. Now, uh, what's interesting in looking at the numbers is that while that crushes all the installs for any other Nintendo launch game that they have published, because uh, remember, they didn't publish Pokemon Go, the Pokemon company did, uh, we have to look at the actual revenue, because that's what Nintendo cares the most about. And, well, Super Mario Run actually had $16 million in its first week, so it's not on pace with that. Uh, and it, their best game out there, uh, Fire Emblem Heroes in its first week did 18, or I'm sorry, 28 million or so in actual revenue in its first week while only having 8.1 million installs. So the gotcha mechanics in that game clearly uh, clicked with Fire Emblem fans versus what's happening with Mario Kart Tour. Now, I do think it's going to make more money than Mario Run in the long haul because if you remember, Super Mario Run was a one time $10 payment, uh, whereas this is going to be more continual revenue. And with 90 million installs, you know there's going to be more and more and more. I wouldn't be surprised if this thing hits half a billion installs or more at some point. Uh, and it's going to generate more and more revenue. It's just not generating a high percentage of revenue compared to the installs. Uh, we'll see how happy Nintendo is with that. But they got to be pleased that there's a lot of people playing it. So uh, I expect to see some changes or updates that might mess around with how that game makes money in the future. Um, I'm hoping that uh, it, it's not a system that we end up hating. But uh, what are you going to do? Uh, it's just something that we have to deal with right now. Uh, I happen to think Mario Kart Tour is actually a pretty decent mobile game. Uh, not, it's not Mario Kart 9, so I, I don't expect that. But uh, I don't know. It's fun to pick up and play a little bit here and there if you can get used to the weird touch control sliding thing. I mean, I got used to it, but uh, I know not everyone can. My kids haven't figured it out yet, so... So the director of Overwatch, as well as Blizzard on the whole, has publicly stated, I'm sure they've privately stated this as well, that any character in Overwatch is welcome to join the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate roster. Now, we do know that, that, that Nintendo started wrapping up the Fighter Pass that had added five new characters to the game, but Sakurai did announce in the last big Smash Bros. update that there will be more DLC characters added beyond that. So while I don't think an Overwatch character was considered for the, this current Fighter Pack, it's definitely something that could be considered for future fighter packs. Now, the director himself of Overwatch did say that he would prefer Nintendo to choose Tracer, but at this point, we just have to know that Nintendo, or, or I guess if you care about Overwatch, um, we just have to know Nintendo's actually going to pick a character from Overwatch at all before we start thinking about, oh, which character could it be? I don't know, maybe what... Maybe, I guess go down in the comments below and tell me what, what what's, what's your favorite character from Overwatch, and then which character from Overwatch would you like to see appear in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate? I think... Every video game developer in the world basically would love to have a character from their game in Smash Bros. Ultimate. I mean, Microsoft has publicly said several times that they wouldn't mind it, even if Master Chief went in it for some reason. So uh, Smash Bros. is slowly becoming a celebration of all of gaming. Uh, and Paladins is shutting down in like China and, and, and potentially some other countries as well. Uh, not in the United States or, or most of Europe, so we're actually pretty fortunate for that. And that kind of gives Overwatch a nice boost in some of those other territories on Switch, since it'll be the only game really like that, the, one of those arena shooters. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the future, but uh, I'm all for an Overwatch character joining uh, the roster. I don't care if it's a female or male, I don't care you know skin colors. I, I have no preferred character in Overwatch, so uh, hey, more potential DLC characters from major IPs is something I am always welcome to. After all, we got Banjo-Kazooie, and I never thought that was possible. So now, for the rest of my life, I'll just keep praying that Conker makes it in someday. When I know that's probably not happening, because one of his main attacks would have to be him peeing on people, and I, I don't know if Nintendo's going to let that happen, but hey, you never know. Mario and Luigi RPG. You guys know that one, right? It's been on, on a lot of the handheld systems for a long time. Well, the Mario and Luigi RPG series, with the latest entry being Bowser's Inside Story, which is like a remake with extra content... Uh, yeah, their parent company, Alpha Dream, the, the big developer, they're bankrupt. 
Uh, they filed for bankruptcy, I think, as of yesterday. And uh, we don't know all the exact details on where their finances stand today. We do know back in March of 2018 that they reported $4.2 million in debt. And this is USD. It's some crazy 562 million yen or whatever, whatever you know. You, I did the conversion for you guys already. So uh, this is obviously... Um, a little bit of a sad story because some people really love the Mario and Luigi series and these guys have basically made every single game uh, and now they won't be anymore. And then the popularity of the series has been waning in a long time. And, and in fact, Bowser's Inside Story did so poorly this year that Nintendo actually canceled other plans for Nintendo 3DS uh, because of it. So that's just something to take into consideration here. Uh, I know a lot of people are hoping the series does find a way to continue and that Nintendo either passes it on to another developer or potentially hires on the developers um, that no longer have jobs from Alpha Dream after filing bankruptcy and continue to develop the game under Nintendo's umbrella. But I don't know. With the game waning in popularity, it's potential that this just might be the latest Nintendo IP to just not be made anymore. You know, like the F-Zeros of the world and stuff like that where Nintendo's like, hey, we're just not making these games anymore. Uh, so we don't have any evidence to suggest that's what's going to happen, but when the actual development team goes down and that's all that development team has really been making, it doesn't look good for the future of the franchise. Uh, and I don't know how much Nintendo really wants to invest in it, but my heart goes out to all of the people and the families um, affected by this bankruptcy claim because obviously once you hit bankruptcy, that's usually the end of the company and everyone basically loses their job. There is a way to file bankruptcy and still bounce back and, and rebuild the company, but uh, that's in the United States. I'm not really sure how bankruptcy works in Japan. So again, I feel for all the families and developers, uh, more so than I feel for the gamers that might miss out on future Mario and Luigi games because um, you know, real human people matter way more than our ability to enjoy um, a video game series. And if this is the end for Mario and Luigi, I mean... I'll say this, Bowser's Inside Story, while you know, it, it's kind of an add-on to an existing game, uh, it's really good. And I always thought it was a mistake that it was coming to 3DS anyways with Switch Out, but uh, it is what it is, and maybe the games will be remastered someday for Switch or something. But uh, I feel for you guys, uh, I feel for the fans who are going to miss the series, and I feel for the families affected. And uh, let me just say this, um, I'm going to say a prayer for all of you guys tonight. Our last story of the day is actually a multifaceted story because we're talking about the Japanese sales charts from last week. Uh, all the news broke yesterday, and I'm just going to break down what matters to it for you guys today. Dragon Quest XI S, as an example, launched last week on Switch. The Echoes of a whatever, Definitive Edition, I forget what, Elusive Age, I think? Echoes of an Elusive Age. Um, so it sold over 300,000 units in Japan and debuted at number one for Switch. That's great. Um, that's excellent. That's really good numbers. But some people have told me, well, those numbers don't sound that great because when it launched last year on PlayStation 4, it did 960,000 units. And that's true. It did. It actually had a way better debut on PlayStation 4 in Japan than it did on Switch. And Switch has more units in Japan than PlayStation 4. So what gives? Well, there's something to consider here. And this is not something that a lot of people seem to be talking about. At the time that it released on PlayStation 4, it also released on 3DS. And the 3DS version of Dragon Quest XI sold 1.15 million units. Obviously, that is a big margin of Nintendo's market is in 3DS in Japan. Because we know 3DS is huge, even bigger than Switch. So, that being the case, I'm actually not that surprised that a year later, a late port in Japan that already sold multiple millions of copies between PlayStation 4 and 3DS didn't debut with like a million selling. Because why would it? Why would people double dip if you own 3DS? Uh, or you own a PlayStation 4, why would you double dip on this game? Even though it is the best version of the game, and it combines modes from previous versions of the game, and it reorchestrates some of the soundtrack and all that, all of it's optional. There's also additional content. There's a lot of reasons to pick it up. If you're a Dragon Quest fan, I could see why people might not want to double dip in Japan specifically. So uh, I think 300k sales is actually really, really good for a year late port. I would have been very interested to see what a day and date, like if it would release a PlayStation 4, 3DS, and Switch at the same time, I would have been very curious to see what the sales would have been then. I have a feeling it might have been north of 300k. Uh, but again, I will have to see what, what happens worldwide. But I, I think in general, we should be pretty impressed with these sales. And what's even more impressive is the massive hold that Nintendo Switch sales did. Now last week, over 200,000 units, debuted a Switch Lite, no shocker there. 
Blue Link's Awakening, all that jazz. But see, this week it actually sold 196,000 units in total. Now, 80,000 of those units were Switch Lite, about 115,000 or so were uh, you know normal Nintendo Switch. But but normal Nintendo Switch sales actually increased week over week. It went from 60,000 to 115, almost doubling uh, the amount of units sold. Switch Lite sales obviously came down from launch, which is expected. But that does mean that Dragon Quest XI was a system seller for Switch. Think about that. That's why I said, are the sales really that bad or are they really impressive because um, they sold Switches? In fact, this same week a year ago, they only sold about 46,000 units. Uh, so that's a pretty big increase year over year. Clearly, Dragon Quest XI played a big role in that and obviously Switch Lite being on the market as well. So uh, that's crazy to me. I think these numbers are, are amazing. Uh, what is interesting for Sony side of things is they had five brand new titles released in Japan last week and all five of them are in the top 10. And this is in addition to the Monster Hunter Definitive Edition, uh, Iceborne stuff. And because of that, this is the first time this year that PlayStation outnumbers Switch titles in the top 10. So there are six titles on PlayStation 4 in the top 10 of sales, only four first Nintendo Switch, but in the top 30, Switch still dominates with like 20 plus of the games. So that's not a, too big of a surprise, I suppose. Uh, so yeah, I, it's just kind of, there's a lot of great games that released on PlayStation last week. So it, it had a nice week. However, PlayStation sales, uh, as you're seeing on the chart, are not that great in comparison to Switch. So uh, PlayStation's clearly at the end of life anyways. But there's still a lot of people in Japan, millions, you know, 7, 8 million uh, people who own a PlayStation 4 in Japan. So, um, you know, they're still going to keep buying games as long as they keep coming out. Uh, that being said, Link's Awakening fell to number 4 because of some of these new releases, selling about 46, 45,000 or so, whatever units. Uh, it is what it is. Looks good. Um, sales on it are still doing great. Probably will cross half a million at some point, maybe even a million. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what the long tail sales are for Link's Awakening. Uh, I don't think it's going to match Breath of the Wild, of course. Breath of the Wild being the best-selling Zelda game in Japan history. Best-selling game in the Zelda franchise history. So I uh, don't expect Breath of the Wild numbers there long haul. But hey, it's still good. Uh, and I'm pretty pleased overall with uh, what we're seeing out of these Japan charts. Switch is just dominating. And we're not even to the holidays yet. Think about that. We're not even to holiday season. And this is what Switch is doing. What's Luigi's Mansion going to pull? Heck, we talked about Pokemon Sword and Shield for the first game. That's huge in Japan. What's that going to do? Is it going to be record numbers? Because the Pokemon company definitely seems to be expecting record numbers there. So, anyways, uh, that's all I got for you guys. I, I, I want to thank you so much for tuning in. Um, boom. Two page of massive notes. Gone. Done with. Um, I did get a new pair of glasses, by the way, guys. You see this? See this? That, I mean, they look kind of similar to my old glasses, but a little bit different. A little bit different on the side. Uh, on the bottoms, whatever. They're new glasses. I also have contacts, by the way. Uh, that's why you guys have been seeing me a lot without glasses on, because I have contacts. I, it's weird. I haven't worn contacts in 15 years, and now I have them again. Uh, that's cool. And uh, you might have seen me playing with this a little bit. I don't know how well it shows up on camera. Uh, yeah, that's an engagement ring that my fiance gave me yesterday. Uh, we are getting married. I talked about this in the live stream before. Uh, we are getting married next year. We're targeting um, a date in August, but we'll have to see if that works out once we uh, meet with the priest later. But things are moving fast in my world. Um, I'm obviously doing okay health-wise as I'm sitting here on camera under this hot light with this burning light straight in front of me that's just blinding me. So uh, whew, thank you guys for tuning in. Don't have anything else for you. No jokes. I just, this is a lot of news. What was your favorite news piece from this? from this. I don't know. And this doesn't even get into all the news that might come out today. This is all stuff that happened yesterday. Except for that Pokemon stream. That's tomorrow. Tune in for that. Alright folks, Thunder Robo Jets, Nintendo Prime, catch you in the next video.